It was around lunchtime when Noah and I arrived at the base of the hiking trail. He practically ejected himself from the car the moment we were no longer in motion. His enthusiasm was infectious. I retrieved our backpacks from the seat behind me and stepped outside as well. Noah had already run ahead. He was standing among the wildflowers and tall grass, looking back with an expectant grin as to say, Keep up, nerd. His disheveled mop of bleached curls and oversized t-shirts swayed in the warm, dry breeze. Poor guy was built like a flagpole, but hell if I wasn't into it at the time. I rolled my eyes with an amused sigh and jogged up to him, then tossed him his backpack, which he almost fell over trying to catch. The year was 2014. We were fresh out of high school, and we were now blissfully enjoying the remainder of our summer. The plan was to make our way up to some landmark called Willem Bridge. Noah's parents apparently owned a cabin there that they rarely used. The perfect weekend getaway for a pair of horny teenagers desperate for some privacy. Mainly, I was just glad we could stop hooking up in my dad's car. Certain stains were getting harder to explain away. The day was a scorcher. The woods provided cover from the sun's immediate glare, but there was no escaping the heat itself. It made an otherwise easy trek feel as if we were embarking on a goddamn expedition. Oh, please tell me there's air conditioning up there, or at least a working fan. I complained while wiping streams of sweat from my forehead. Afraid not. Thanks Pop's got a leaf blower last time we were out there, though, if that helps. Noah answered with that trademark shit-eating grin of his, face glistening with perspiration. <laughs> Very cute. The path tapered as we reached an impressive arrangement of boulders and rocks, like the result of a landslide. I slowed my pace in order to retrieve the water bottle from the cluttered bowels of my backpack, which Noah interrupted as his cue to run ahead of me once more. He strolled up to one of the moss-covered slabs and then for reasons best known to himself, determined that it was his duty to climb it. I shook my head and squeezed the plastic bottle, shooting a refreshing jet of lukewarm water directly into my mouth. Oh god, I wish that was me, Noah teased from the presumed safety of his perch. It won't be if you keep it up. Let's go before I pass out. Just a sec. I had no choice but to continue supervising this 18-year-old toddler as he hopped from surface to surface. Eventually, after clearing a rather precarious gap, he latched onto the side of a particularly large boulder and clambered up to its peak. There he triumphantly sat, feet swinging and eyes honed on what must have been an impressive view of the park. You're lucky you're so endearing. Noah stuck his tongue out in response, after which he went back to admiring the scenery. I conceded and plopped onto a nearby patch of flattened grass. Once seated, I squinted upward at the looming evergreen, catching glimpses of the sky through its tangled mesh of needles and branches. Instead of taking the time to appreciate the untamed serenity of nature, however, for some reason I decided to broach that one topic that Noah hated discussing. So, when do you think we should tell our folks? You know, about us? Predictably, his mood turned instantly sour. He threw his head back with a groan, clearly annoyed at me for reviving the subject. Come on, man. I'm tired. I'm tired of sneaking around. I'm tired of lying. I'm tired of getting slapped away every time I try to hold your hand in public. My mom and pops aren't exactly progressive either, but I'm ready to come out if you are. Yeah, but I'm not ready. I'll literally get disowned if they find out. You know that. So, what? You're fine pretending like we're not a thing? Like, I don't fucking exist? Oh my god, can you not be a selfish asshole for five fucking seconds? I told you, I'm not ready. Noah's uncharacteristic but admittedly deserved outburst echoed across the Pinewood Forest. We both sat in tense silence for a good while, me with my knees pressed to my chest and him staring at his dangling feet. I chewed on my lips and averted my eyes in an effort to stave off the tears. Feelings of hurt, guilt, and regret came together to form a lump in my throat. 
I shouldn't have pressed him. I, I knew that. But at the same time, I was so sick and tired of having to conceal something so obtusely trivial as my own sexual preference, and all for the sake of complying with someone else's outdated ideology. Pride in my raw lips, intended to utter an apology when suddenly a third voice chimed in. Don't mean to interrupt, but y'all doing alright over here? I was nearby and heard yelling. Surprised, I spun around and saw our anonymous spectator emerge from the surrounding woods. The first thing that stood out to me about the woman was her excessively long hair. It was white, peppered with the occasional strand of silver, and spilled past her knees in thick, heavy clumps. Tangled in it were various twigs, leaves, and God knows what else, making her appear like some sort of ancient woodland spirit. After a rushed and clumsy descent, Noah rejoined me on our side of the clearing. Sorry if we startled you, ma'am. Just had a disagreement, that's all. He stumbled to explain, face red and burning with embarrassment. The old woman smiled and leaned against her walking stick. If I had to guess, she was probably in her late 60s to early 70s, though her unkempt appearance made it difficult to tell for certain. Behind the curtains of hair... She wore a faded yellow dress that barely clung to a pair of weak shoulders. It looked to have once had a floral pattern, though it was difficult to tell for certain. Takes a heck of a lot more to do that than start with this old hag. Haven't heard your voice before, though. Guessing you ain't locals. No, ma'am. Promptly confirmed Noah. Can it with the man thing, boy. I ain't your school teacher. Name's Agnes. As the old woman introduced herself, I noticed that she wasn't looking directly at, but rather past us. It took me a moment, perhaps longer than it should have, to realize that she was visually impaired, if not outright blind. I couldn't help but wonder what someone in her condition was doing out here all alone. My boyfriend nudged me, hitting that it was my turn to say something. Pleasure to meet you, was all that I could think to add. I purposefully omitted the courtesy of revealing our own names. Regardless of how harmless she appeared, I had a gut feeling that there was more to Agnes than what we're capable of readily perceiving. Perhaps sensing my distrust, she gave me a nod and made a point of moving the conversation along. Anywho, I'd be careful if I were y'all. The wolves would be out soon. Wolves? Here? <laughs> I've heard of foxes and coyotes, but never mentioned of any wolves, Noah asked with an understandable degree of skepticism. After all, our state isn't known for its native wolf population. You're more likely to get mauled by a bear or get trampled by a deer than you are to encounter one outside of a zoo. Oh, trust me, they're out here all right, and they sure as hell know you're here. My advice is to do what you gotta do and head back. These woods ain't as safe as they used to be. Noah and I looked at each other, mutely concurring that the woman was clearly not all there. The sun was still beating down on us relentlessly, and we were eager to get a move on, so we just thanked Agnes for the warning and continued up the trail. Once there was a considerable distance between us and her, I looked over my shoulder and saw glimpses of the crone-like figure disappearing back into the woods. There was no evidence of her ever having been there, apart from the residual feeling of unease in the pit of my stomach. After more strenuous hiking, we finally arrived beneath Willem's Bridge, which, contrary to expectations, wasn't an actual bridge, but rather a natural arch between two neighboring cliff sides, effectively forming a sort of gateway. The lodge was a stone throw away from it, situated near the center of another, larger clearing. It was quite the picturesque little property, straight out of a brochure or a lifestyle magazine. I've always been more of a city dweller myself, but even I wasn't immune to its rural charm. We shared a cold shower together and spent the rest of the afternoon indoors. As the day progressed, the torrid temperatures dropped to mostly manageable levels. We decided to have a stroll around the homestead before packing up and heading back. Turns out that sightseeing is significantly more enjoyable when you aren't on the verge of a heat stroke. Who knew? We watched the once oppressive sun now dip behind the hills, dyeing the sky in a palette of reds and oranges which 
gradually gave way to an encroaching tide of grayish blue. Holy shit, Noah exclaimed. At first I thought he was enthralled by the view, but I looked over and saw him veer off in a seemingly random direction. Here we go again, I thought. I didn't even attempt to match his pace, I just trailed behind while simulating enthusiasm. A stench of rotting meat assaulted my senses before I perceived the actual carcass. From a distance, it just looked like a mound of dirt. But then I noticed the antlers and the swarm of flies hovering above it. There, sprawled along a shallow ditch, was the half-eaten body of an adult deer. That is so fucking gross. I stated the obvious through pinched nostrils. The creature's lower half was picked clean, and what scraps still remained were being feasted upon by hordes of wriggling maggots. Flaps of fermented flesh hung from exposed ribs, mired in a sickening miasma of decay. I think the weird old prune might have been telling the truth. I glanced down at Noah, who was squatting next to the Dan animal's skull and poking at it with a branch. He gingerly pushed the fur around its neck aside, revealing multiple bite marks. We, of course, weren't exactly qualified to determine whether the culprits had indeed been wolves, but the woman's ramblings didn't seem so far-fetched all of a sudden. Let's just grab our shit and go. I pulled my boyfriend up to his feet and we quickly made our way back to the lodge. Dusk was starting to settle. A peculiar sense of gloom hung in the air. As I pushed the front door open, I was greeted by an unexpected yet familiar visage. Blocking the cramped entryway was none other than Agnes herself. The sightless, scrawny woman stood there like a pale apparition, her form outlined by the dimness of the interior. Lock your damn door, she remarked with a plain tone and retreated further inside, ushering us both to follow. We did albeit with a substantial degree of uncertainty. Our uninvited guests cautiously maneuvered between the furniture. I heard her joints pop as she found a suitable seat by the cold fireplace. Her hair brushed against the floorboards, her clouded eyes concealed beneath a waterfall of silver tresses. Mustering a modicum of courage, I said, You shouldn't be here. Agnes proceeded to snort in amusement. She tapped her long, spindly fingers against the arm of the chair. <laughs> Bunny I was just about to say the same thing. As if to emphasize her point, a choir of longing howls suddenly tore through the stillness outside. I felt the tension from before rise in my stomach to my chest, evolving into proper dread. Noah rushed to the nearest window while I just stood there, glaring at the hag, who in turn looked utterly aloof. How about it, fellers? Y'all believe the weird old prune now? What do you want? Watch your tone, boy. I'm trying to keep you safe. Keep us safe? Why? From, from what? From the goddamn wolves, she shouted rising slightly from her chair with an unexpected vigor. Ain't you listening to what I've been telling you? I'm the first. They're here because of me. And I don't want any more folks dying because of an old grudge. Chill, lady. What the hell are you... All of a sudden there was a thump, closely followed by a rattle. Noah slowly withdrew from the window. His expression was a blend between complete bewilderment and fear, the kind that debilitates you and leaves you unsure whether you're meant to flee or hold your ground. As I peeked over his shoulder, I noticed that the glass was still shaking, as if someone had slapped it before running away. I gently squeezed past my terror-stricken boyfriend, walked up to it, and leaned in. 
Just as I was about to announce that there was nobody out there, a human fist collided with the pain, this time causing it to explode. Shards scattered like shrapnel. Reaching in, the meaty hand wrapped around my throat and pulled me towards the window, dragging my entire body through it before dumping me onto the wooden porch outside. Shattered glass crunched beneath me as I landed. I rolled onto my hands and knees, straining to produce a cough. Noah shrieked in the background, his voice quickly drowned out by the cacophony of barks and ravenous growls. I had to get to him. I had to. Ignoring the bitter taste of blood in my mouth, I looked up at my assailant. Standing over me was the figure of a man. A large, corpulent man with arms twice the size of mine and a bloated gut to match. There was a disgusting sheen of filth covering the entirety of his naked body and consequently suffocating the inflamed sores that occupied its various greasy crevices. The most grotesque feature of them all, however, was undoubtedly the face. His nose was pressed against his skull and his lips were peeled back, revealing blackish gums that had curved, dog-like canines protruding from them. Images of the bite marks around the dead deer's neck flashed briefly before my eyes. The beast man unhinged his oversized jaw and snapped at the air in front of me, drool seeping from beneath his carnivorous teeth. I wanted to crawl away, but as soon as I reached the edge of the platform, I realized that there was nowhere left to go. Multiple sets of hungry eyes stared back at me. There was an entire pack of those freakish amalgamations surrounding the lodge each more inhuman than the last. I saw a tall woman whose deformed and disproportionately long limbs allowed her to exclusively walk on all fours. And then there was the man with sharp ears and half his body covered in fur. Behind them both was something that could hardly be categorized as a person, possessing claws and a fleshy, languid appendage that vaguely resembled a tail. I'd compare them to animals but that would imply a degree of inculpability. They weren't driven by simple instinct. There was intent behind their viciousness, and their wretched forms only reflected it. There was a wet snarl in my ear, followed by a sensation of weightlessness before I was slammed back down against the unforgiving redwood. The air was knocked out of my lungs. I would have cried in agony if I could. The mutant crowd of spectators jumped with sadistic excitement. Some chanted garbled phrases that were impossible to decipher over the ringing in my skull. Others just yapped and howled, encouraging my abuse. Using my elbows, I desperately tried to pull myself forth, only to be picked up for a third and final time. The hulking mass of greasy flesh lifted me above its head and once again savagely bounced my limp body off the wooden deck. Something audibly snapped. I couldn't tell whether it was a loose board or one of my ribs. Helpless and gasping, I lay there among the broken glass. The world kept fading in and out. Darkness occupied the corners of my waning vision and... In spite of my attempts to stave it off, to remain conscious. It eventually swallowed everything. Including me. I was standing beneath Willem Bridge. The trees around me bore shades of autumn and the air smelled of rain. Across from me, bathed in the shadow of the rocky archway, was a young girl. Her black hair was tied in long braids that had small charms interwoven into them. Her dark, narrow eyes glazed at me spitefully, her lips curled in disdain. I noticed that she kept tugging on the hem of her bright yellow dress, which was dotted with flowery motifs and looked slightly too big for her. She was trying to conceal the bump inside of her stomach. Given her age, the implications of a pregnancy were disconcerting to say the least, especially coupled with the clear signs of abuse, like the purple rings of bruises around her neck. She bent over picked a tiny rock off the ground and threw it at me. It bounced against my chest, landing squarely at my feet. Tears of hatred and frustration rolled down her face. The girl grabbed the fabric around her swollen belly, clenching it in her fist. Suddenly a bitter smile tore through her face. 
I was stuck in the role of passive observer, watching through someone else's eyes as dark red bubbles began to appear around the corners of her grin. Something was trying to crawl its way out of her. She lurched back, pressed her palms to her stomach, and after what felt like hours of painful retching, a long bony arm burst forth from her mouth. The ghastly appendage flailed aimlessly before digging its beast-like claws into the host's lower jaw and stretching it past its limit, leaving ample room for another set of fingers to emerge, and then a wolfish skull, and then a torso, and then a leg. My senses were polluted by the familiar stench of rot. I looked down. In place of the pebble that was previously thrown at me was the decaying head of a deer. Its lolled tongue began to twitch. It turned its sunken dead eyes up at me and said, Marcus! Marcus! For fuck's sake, please wake up! My eyes shot open. I tried to sit up, but a sharp ache in my ribs forced me to reconsider. I was back on that porch. Only now, I had Noah kneeling by my side. I heard him breathe a tense sigh, presumably revealed to see me conscious again. He hastily brushed some of the glass off me, and before I could ask him what was going on, I was already being pulled out to my feet. The pain spread, radiating throughout my upper body, but I did my best to block it out. Though my mind was still rattled, Noah's trembling tone was enough to convey a sense of urgency. Come on, get up. We gotta go. We... What? As I reluctantly guided my eyes away from Noah's pleading expression and towards the clearing, I was greeted by a sight that was terrifying as it was surreal. Blood flowed freely from the recently decapitated torsos, dyeing the grass beneath them crimson. There were limbs and other minced body parts scattered haphazardly about, guts hung from branches like some sort of twisted Christmas display with the disembodied shell lying lifeless beneath it, features frozen in a mute scream of agony. A layer of gore was splattered across every conceivable surface, but it was the imposing figure at the center of the hellscape that truly made me question my sanity. It stood as tall as the trees, a gangling, bipedal sculpture of muscle and protruding bone. Its skin was stretched so tightly that I could see the individual vertebrae shifting in its back. It was hairless apart from the pale mane of blood-stained fur dangling from its skull, mercifully obscuring its true visage. Only its lupine muzzle stuck out from beneath the strands, aligned with rows of jagged, interlocking teeth that couldn't even fit inside of its own mouth. The worst part was that, as unfathomably monstrous as it was, there was still something about it that I recognized an underlying, tragic element that eluded description. I watched the creature effortlessly pick up one of the lifeless bodies left bleeding on the ground, its long fingers wrapped around the lesser abomination's ripping remains, and lifted them up to its gaping jaws. The crunch that followed finally caused me to avert my eyes. I sought comfort against Noah's chest, pressing my face against it. I can't be real. This can't be real, I whimpered. We have to go, my boyfriend repeated, feigning courage as best he could. He threw my arm over his shoulders and led us away from the lodge. I could feel his rapid breathing on my cheek. His eyes darted wildly in search of a trail back. As evening approached, we pulled out our phones and used them to illuminate the path ahead. A pair of artificial lights shining in unison kept the encroaching darkness at bay, if only temporarily. If not for the context, it would have been quite poetic. What the hell happened back there? I finally asked, still wincing. For a while there was no answer, only the rustling of leaves. Agnes, she... she... She told me to grab you and make a run for it and that she'll hold those freaks off. Then she just... She just ran out the door and... Fuck me, man. I don't know. Noah shook his head as if trying to erase or at least suppress that particular memory. 
When that didn't work, he went on, growing more frantic with each sentence. She started... changing? He phrased it almost like a question, like he didn't fully trust his own recollection. They piled onto her, trying to hold her down, but there was no point. She ripped into them like a fucking chainsaw, and the more she... The more it ate, the more it grew, and his chin trembled. His attempt at a stoic expression crumbled away, revealing glimpses of the traumatized teenager behind it. God, please tell me you saw that thing too. Please tell me it wasn't all in my head. It's okay. I saw it too. I assured him in the most comforting tone I could muster, though... In truth, a part of me still held out hope that this was a cruel dream. One by one, stars twinkled into existence. Wilhelm Bridge became a distant silhouette against the dimming sky, and soon dipped behind the forest entirely as if it never existed. The blood loss from my various cuts, coupled with the intermittent stabs of pain, rendered each step a challenge, but we eventually made our way back to the car. Noah ended up driving me into the nearest walk-in clinic, which thankfully wasn't very far. Turns out that I was right about the broken rib. I was apparently quite lucky that it hadn't punctured a lung. It took half a year, but I eventually made a full recovery, save for a few unsightly scars. When questioned, we opted for the more believable version of the events, explaining that we were attacked by a group of crazy hillbillies in the woods, which is the same version we later gave to our parents. Lying proved to be the right call, since the local sheriff's department apparently found nothing out of the ordinary when they went up there to survey the scene. No obscene amounts of gore, no half-eaten mutant corpses, no nothing. Though I suspect it would have been immediately covered up, even if they did. Regardless, I won't be planning any trips to Wilhelm Bridge in the foreseeable future. I've mostly kept my therapist's advice and never really gone down that proverbial rabbit hole. Perhaps digging into the site's history might yield some context to the horrors we experienced that day, but I feel like some things are best forgotten to time. In fact, consider this a parting letter to that entire chapter of my life. Noah and I are finally getting married in January, after which we'll be planning a permanent move to Pennsylvania cliche thing to do would be to warn you against trying to find the actual landmark I may or may not have renamed Wilhelm's Bridge for the purpose of my story, but we all know how that usually goes. If you do end up finding it, however, do me a favor. If you see an old woman with long white hair and a yellow dress, tell her I said thanks. For as long as I can remember, I've seen ghosts. Okay, well, that's not entirely true, but I do have vivid hallucinations practically every night. My logical mind completely understands that the objects and creatures I see are just a manifestation of my weary mind having just awakened from a dream state. But my younger years found me terrified of things I saw in the night. I've had chronic insomnia since I was a child, so I take over-the-counter sleep aids nightly to be able to rest. These pills surely cause me to fall deeply into REM sleep, but medications or not, I still frequently wake up in the wee hours of the morning, and that's when I see things. I've seen everything from a five-foot penguin dancing beside my bed to a full-on Roswell alien reaching out through a portal above my head. I remember one time I saw a man just sitting at my bedside where I lay with half his body inside the stereo that sat on a table at the side of my bed. By this point I knew they were manifestations of my sleeping subconscious, so I just swatted my hand through them. It was mildly disturbing the way he just retreated backwards while staying in that hunched over sitting position, just staring at me. Regardless of the oddness of the situation, I just rolled over and went back to sleep. 
I used to have crazy reoccurring dreams, too. I'm not sure if they influenced my hallucinations or not, but they were equally as strange and disturbing as some of the more unsettling images. Sure, I had plenty of falling to my death dreams or flying above the rest of the world at rest, but completely unrelated dreams would have the occasional guest star. He was like that sitcom cameo character that would always enter to the wild applause of the live audience, but not as remotely as friendly and inviting. He looked like he wore a loose skin suit that was five sizes too large. It just drooped and sagged from his limbs as he shuffled toward me. He reminded me, in a way, of the guy who crashed the van into a toxic waste in Robocop back in the day. It's possible that very movie influenced his visits into my sleeping mind, effectively transforming an innocent dream into a nightmare that I would jerk awake from. I remember one of them quite vividly. I was just walking in my car as the sun was setting, and I saw him, standing away as up the road. Though many dreams withheld memories of other night's activities, I recognized him as soon as I noticed him off in the distance. I ran to my car while he shuffled slowly toward me, and I locked the door as soon as I got in. He was still far off when I entered my vehicle, but as soon as I locked the door, he was right outside my window. He hammered his fleshy hand into the window, leaving slick trails of sweat or slime of some sort. With every pound of his loose skin, he would say, Sleeper, in a voice that almost sounded like Boris Karloff's Frankenstein. I woke in a cold sweat and still saw the image of the man in his wrinkled skin suit clouded in the darkness of my bedroom, though I could no longer hear his impetuous voice. Perpetuous. I woke in a cold sweat and still saw the image of the man in his wrinkled skin suit clouded in the darkness of my bedroom, though I could no longer hear his repetitious voice. His visits in my dreams would always make it hard to get back to sleep, but it's been some time since the last time I saw him. I actually hope that revisiting his memory will not set the seeds in my mind to bring a return visit tonight. Regardless of the unnerving imagery I've seen, both in my sleep and out of it, nothing has ever disturbed me more than what my half-asleep eyes showed me a few years back. All things considered, he wasn't nearly as disturbing as many of my other hallucinations, but there was just something about him that left a stain on me. Not to mention the fact that his visits became somewhat regular. Rarely do I see the same visitors more than once, aside from my saggy-skinned friend, but even he wouldn't show up as frequently. The new guy, for lack of a better term, almost resembled some sort of human-sized puppet, without the side of cute and cuddly. He wore a green one-piece pajama scent that appeared patterned to look like a frog. He never had the hood pulled up over his head, but I imagined it to have big, circular eyes that would rest on his forehead if he did. His face was smooth and felt like, and his closed mouth spread across his face in a wide smile that almost touched his small, half-circle ears that stuck straight up out the side of his head, sort of like how a Muppet's mouth appears. The way that were to open, it would just flap the top half of his head backward. He had a little upturned bump for a nose, with wide nostrils that seemed hollowed out in the fabric of his face. His eyes were just two small dark holes with no eyebrows above them, and his short forehead cut back right above where his eyebrows would be, with no hair on top. Normally, my nightmare hallucinations appeared clouded in the same darkness the rest of my bedroom holds. This one, however, had its own subtle glow that made him stand out much more vividly. The first time he showed up, I actually found him sort of cute, compared to some of my wilder, imaginary late-night friends. He just stood in the far corner of my bedroom, performing a playful dance. He appeared something more inspired by a kid's show, though it had been many years since I indulged in such programs. I watched with wide and curious eyes as he silently bounced almost clumsily. I rarely knew where the manifestations of my dream state drew their inspirations from, but some could truly be quite bizarre. Some days would pass before his second visit, and I had plenty of other oddballs inhabiting my late-night wake calls until then. 
There was a row of cartoon-like hamsters scrolling across my curtain rod. A four-foot hairless gremlin walked upright on my ceiling. He hung upside down to my view as he made his leisurely stroll. I even saw a comically ridiculous witch brewing something that formed a fine mist in her cauldron. When the six-foot puppet reappeared on the fourth night after our first meeting, he was closer than he was before. He now stood in the dead center of my room, and his dance seemed to emit far less hilarity than it had before. He now swayed side to side, allowing his arms to hang like wet noodles from his shoulders. Though he had no more than small dark holes for eyes, I could feel them stare deeply into mine while he moved eerily from left to right. His head appeared almost detached as it stayed completely still while the rest of his body wobbled. I felt a discomfort that I had not known since the earliest occurrences of my twilight visions. I turned my back to the felt-skinned figment and tried my best to ignore his presence. I still felt his cavernous eyes glaring into the back of my head while I struggled to get back to sleep. At some point, I must have managed to regain my grip on my slumber, as I did not wake to my intended alarm some hours before I jerked back to reality. I felt dazed as I often would when I had not achieved as much rest as my body had requested. I called my job to attempt to explain my tardiness, and my supervisor recommended that I just take the rest of the day off and we'll chalk it up to a sick day. He was a good guy overall. He's one of those rare manager types that actually seems to care for his employees. Some of my bosses at previous jobs would likely have called me a no-call no-show and happily given me a boot. I can't say I was upset about the surprise day off, especially right before the weekend, but I thought it would be best if I sought out a new sleep aid. Perhaps my body was becoming immune to the one I'd used for the better part of a decade. I returned to my house some four hours after heading out to find a new sleeping agent. I checked a couple of local pharmacies to get a variety of opinions on the subject. The first recommended a simple melatonin, which I almost immediately ignored as I'd tried them before and they had little effect on me. The next suggested a liquid form of the gel caps I'd already used, which I was unsure about. Surely the same medication would have little difference regardless of the intake method. I did purchase a bottle anyway. If nothing else, maybe it would kick in faster than having to wait for the pill's disintegration while they bobbed around in my stomach acid. I even grabbed a bigger bottle of my normal method with the intention of simply upping the dosage if chugging them made no difference. I walked the aisles of a few other stores more aimlessly wandering than anything else. I wasn't actively seeking anything in particular. I just felt the urge to kill a little time before heading back home. I hit up a local liquor store on my drive back to see if perhaps a little tequila would assist my pursuit of a full night's rest. If not, the 12-pack of Hennies may nudge it in the right direction. I got back to my house, threw on some Friday night TV after calling in my pizza order. Not the most exciting way to spend my unexpected free day, but the rough sleep of the night before still left me feeling quite groggy and highly unmotivated. Around an hour later, my fresh and deliciously scented Supreme Pizza arrived. I paused the horror anthology movie that had secured my interest before I answered the door to receive my tasty award. Perhaps the series of twisted tales of terror I continued to watch after I sat back down to enjoy my meal was not the best choice for one who sought an insomnia-free sleeping experience. Regardless, I was a fan of the genre and had rarely had nightmares inspired by the viewing of such things, even as a child. It's not that I've never been chased around an abandoned summer camp by an axe-wielding hockey-masked zombie in the occasional dream, I just didn't particularly see them as nightmares. It could be that my sleeping mind knew that these were merely fabrications of my subconscious and saw no reason to jerk myself back to the land of the living on account of them. Once my meal was finished and settling down in my stomach, I felt my eyes becoming heavy. It was only 10 o'clock in this eventless Friday night, but my body was still drained from the night before. 
I took a deep swig of my new sleep-induced concoction, and I finished the third and final beer of the night. Though I knew I would have no trouble falling asleep, even without the meds, I was well aware that if I neglected to take them, I would likely be awake again within a few hours. I cut the TV off, sending the anthology of screams to rest for the night as I raised from my couch to follow suit. Well, hello there! A high-pitched voice called through the night, forcing my dormant eyes to spring open. The puppet man in the frog onesie was staring directly at my face when I awoke. He was crouched on the floor right beside my bed, with his head at a slight tilt. I didn't even see you there, he exclaimed. His voice sounded familiar to that of a famous Disney mouse, if he had been a pack-a-day smoker for forty years anyway. It was high-pitched but scratchy. Do you want to be friends? He asked as his head flopped to the other side of the tilt. His mouth, sure enough, flapped around the top of his head like a muppet. I could even see what looked like the impression of the puppeteer's fingers pressed under the felt on the top side of the mouth. I felt stunned and somewhat perplexed by the inclusion of speaking with my new twilight visitor. I've seen some crazy shit in the wee hours of the morning, but they never uttered sound before. Even the alien that reached through the swirling vortex above my bed did so with the slightest hint of anything audible. I'd already become a bit freaked out by the movements of his most recent creation of my weary mind, but now I was growing downright scared. Well, his squeal of a voice continued, what do you say? I rolled over and attempted to force my eyes shut again. The most interaction I'd ever given these hallucinations was a sleepy swat through the air. I considered doing the same with the one that now crouched at my bedside, but I didn't want to encourage whatever was causing my hallucinations to, I don't know, evolve. They'd never spoken before. What's next? Okay, sleepyhead, the voice echoed behind my head. I'll leave you alone. Sweet dreams. He finished with a high-pitched laugh before he tussled my hair with his four-fingered mitt for a hand. With that, I jerked around and leapt from my bed. I turned the light on to be greeted with nothing more foul than my dirty clothes laid in laundry hamper. What the fuck? I said out loud while gasping for breath. My hands were shaking and my back was tensed up so much it felt like an iron rod. I proceeded to lift up my sheets and check under my bed and swung the closet door open before leafing through the clothes that hung inside, in search of any sign of a late night intruder. I headed out of my bedroom and back downstairs to perch upon my couch. No way I would be sleeping in my bed for the remainder of my night. My thoughts reeled from the figment making physical contact with me, but the rational side of my brain was already hard at work trying to ease my panic. Had to be something else that just gave me the impression of touch, right? Maybe the pillow was more fluffed on the upper side of the section I laid my head on. I may have just inadvertently brushed against it while adjusting my posture. That is far more likely than a felt-handed creature of the night rubbing my noggin. After cleaning off a few more beers, I decided to sleep off the strange events my tired mind produced. Refusing to re-enter my bedroom for the remainder of the night, I grabbed one of my coats from the rack to the side of my front door. I wrapped it around myself and curled up on the couch, leaving the lights on like a nervous child with night terrors. Sure, I wasn't actually proud of the way I was acting in the moment, but the rational portion of my brain had convinced me of the innocent misunderstanding of things as much as I would have liked to. After a good hour of tossing and turning... I finally felt myself doze off for the second time that night. I slept in again, but Saturday did not require me to awaken at a specific time, so no harm done there. I felt far more rested than I did the previous day, so I thought I may actually try to accomplish something with my responsibility-free weekend. I heard and felt my bones creak and crack while I stretched my arms out, accompanied by a long and heavy yawn. On the way to the bathroom to begin the day, with a refreshing shower, I peeked in through my bedroom door. Nothing was out of place. 
and no strange visitors crouched on the floor beside my queen-sized bed. Feeling my sanity adjusting back to its default settings, I continued my quest for showery goodness. I was never a particularly vain individual, but the litter of hair that I watched circle down the drain as I turned off the flow of water to the shower made my heart sink quite a bit. My father had experienced early baldness, and I'd never known him to have much hair aside from the evidence shown in photographs from his youth. I suppose that it was bound to happen eventually as I ran my fingers through my hair in the bathroom mirror. I hadn't really noticed the onset of baldness before that day, but I was rarely prone to pay much attention to my own reflection. I was never a fan of the idea of being that guy with the wrap around the back hairline, so with a heavy sigh, I dug my hair clippers out of the drawer to my left and buzzed the remaining dark hair away. I couldn't have predicted that I'd be rocking the head stubble and hat at the tender age of 23, but at least it was more commonplace look in the current times. I always had a naturally dark complexion and fairly thick eyebrows, so it wasn't as bad as I expected. I made my way out of the home while placing some phone calls to meet up with some friends that I hadn't seen in a few months. Truthfully, I just wanted to spend some time with some actual physical people while maybe getting an idea of how ridiculous I looked now. Matt and Quincy, who I'd been tight with since high school, wasted no time in mocking my new appearance. Sure, they were apt to make fun of anything that struck their fancy on a regular basis, but they assured me it was all in good fun. We spent the rest of the day catching up and reflecting on the times gone by. We were always pretty tight, and they were among the few that I told about my strange hallucinations in the night. Since they were already familiar with these things, I decided to tell them about my more recent, unusual visitations. Quincy had taken some online psychology courses, so he advised that I may be dealing with manifestations of some childhood trauma, or something of that nature. Maddie just indicated that I may just be a full-on cuckoo bird and that I should stop watching stupid movies before bed. I actually took more offense to him calling horror movies stupid than him insinuating I was batshit. It's not like we hadn't called each other far worse things over the years. I can't say I had any recollection of childhood traumas, but Quincy said that's the nature of repression and manifestation. Maddie just laughed and offered, Dude, you've been taking those classes for, what, a year now? You really think that you're ready to be giving any goddamn diagnosis? Quincy simply replied, Hey, he asked for our opinions, right? As the hours grew closer to midnight, my friends and I said our goodbyes and made our separate ways. It was good to see the two of them again. Though it had only been months since our last meeting, it seemed so much longer. Quincy's words had caused me to ponder my personal history a bit, and I planned to take a drive to my parents' house the following day. Perhaps they could shine some light on anything in my past that could have led to the strange occurrences that interrupted my sleep as of late. By the time I reached my home, I was feeling quite exhausted and ready to attempt another night's rest. I chugged my bottle of liquid slumber medication after snapping the deadbolt to my front door shut. I briefly considered climbing into my bed, but opted for snatching my blanket and pillows to carry them down to my couch. It was completely irrational. I knew that, but I had not experienced any emergence of the felt-faced puppet man after retiring to the comfort of my sofa. Could this particular hallucination be unable to traverse a small staircase? Unlikely, but sleeping downstairs provided the best sleep I had in some time. Best to stick with what works, so I curled up under the safety of my thick blankets and let my eyes fall shut. What you doing all the way down here? The high-pitched tones cried out, causing another full night of rest to slip out of grasp again. He sat with his legs folded across each other on the center of my coffee table in front of the couch. He was twiddling his thick, cushioned thumbs while his little dark holes glared at me from the head that hung to the side. I had left the lights on when I passed out earlier, I knew that much, but the room lay dark now. The only light was provided by the tall street lamps outside that shed their glow through my thin curtains. He still sported his own subtle illumination, but there was something slightly different about his appearance now. 
I sat straight up, which brought us to gaze at each other truly face to face for the first time. I could barely convince my lungs to expand and contract while I looked into the fabric facsimile of a face. Though his mouth was just a Pac-Man-like connection of two halves of an ovular circle, it seemed to form an unsettling smile. His shoulders jumped as he let out a single giggle while we shared our staring contest. Come on, buddy, he squeaked. Don't you want to talk to me? He said, spreading his arms out as if to introduce himself. I slowly shook my head side to side in response to his question, though I did not take my eyes off his deep, dark cutouts. Okay, fine then, he said, straightening his back and folding his arms. He turned his head to the side and jutted it upwards like a pouting child. It was then that I noticed what was different about his appearance. Thick, dark hair now sprouted from his previously bald felt scalp. It almost formed a mohawk that protruded from the tip of his short head and traveled back to where his neck met the frog-eyed hood. I rubbed my now stubbled head while not allowing the thoughts that echoed from the recesses of my mind and to take full form. He turned back to me and leaned in toward me. He propped his elbows on top of his knees and leaned his soft lower jaw upon his mitts. Why don't you want to be friends? He asked, with the fabric above his eye holes forming a light frown. He gave a heavy sigh that sent a foul stench of mothballed and decayed old clothing into my face. I almost gagged before he leaned in closer and bounced an outstretched plush finger off my nose with a boop which he followed with a giggle. I don't remember going back to sleep that night, but I awoke on my sofa a little afternoon. I felt a little drained, but no more than some of my uninterrupted slumbers in the past. Perhaps I had just dreamed this particular appearance of my fuzzy-faced visitor. He'd been preying heavily on my thoughts these past few days. After investigating the wide wooden table from across the couch, I found nothing out of place. The empty beer can from the night before still sat on the stained circular coaster. The box of tissues that I'd purchased earlier in the year to combat my seasonal allergies still lay in the center of the table. Shrugging this event off as a product of my overactive imagination, I started to trek up the stairs for my daily shower called my mom to be sure that she and my dad would be at the house before I started out on the 45-minute drive to reach my childhood home. She sounded quite giddy at the news of my visit, which caused me a flash of guilt as it had been far too long since I'd seen them in person. There had been plenty of phone calls, text messages, and emails, but I never seemed to find the time to share their company. They were loving and attentive parents, but they respected the space that a young adult required after moving out of the home they grew up in. Still, I really should try to spend more time with them. As soon as I stepped through the door, my mother wrapped her arms around me. My father just clapped me on the shoulder with his outstretched arm and greeted me with a sincere, It's good to see you, kiddo. Once upon a time, I would have scowled at my dad for referring to me as a kid, but I couldn't help but become immersed in the nostalgia of being back here after too much time away. My mom quickly let me go to scamper into the kitchen to attend to the cookies she started baking after my call. This caught me off guard at first as I used to bask in the scent of my mother's baking as a child. I hadn't noticed any sort of appetizing smell when I entered the house my folks had owned for years before I came along. Moments after my mom had fled to the kitchen, she came strolling back in, sporting twin oven mitts and a steaming tray of chocolate chip cookies. She would never lower herself to using the canned dough to prepare such a treat. She mixed them by hand, and they tasted so much more delightful than any pre-packaged snack you could find at your local grocery store. Though I still couldn't so much as pick up a whiff of the tasty goodness the now cooling stove had produced, My mouth watered in anticipation. They're still really hot, my mom said proudly as she set the tray down on the padded prop in the middle of their large dining table. 
She playfully smacked my hand when I extended my arm toward the steaming pan, risking certain burnt flesh in my desire to taste the delicious treat. I gave in and agreed to allow the snacks to reach a tolerable temperature before lunging at them a second time. We began the obligatory conversation to catch up on each other's lives since our last meeting. It really had been some time since we last talked like this. My mom told me about her artistic ventures while my dad bitched about his job. He would be retiring next year, and it sounded like he was more than ready. My mother hadn't worked since she fought off cancer some years back, but she came out the other side of that battle with the urge to paint again. She'd always talked about how she loved to do such things when she was younger, but life took priority over her dreams. My father's job paid well enough to make life easy for them, though he despised it with a fiery passion. <laughs> okay, go ahead, my mom said giggling as she noticed me eyeballing the tray again. I instantly crammed the entirety of a wide and soft cookie into my mouth. Both my parents laughed at my enthusiasm, but when my mom asked, So are they good as you remember? I couldn't give her an answer. As delectable as I knew my mother's baking to be, I could not even slightly taste it. I wasn't about to tell the woman who wore a proud smile across her face that I could not reap the benefits of her craft at the moment. I just gave her a wide grin, revealing chunks of crumpled cookie bits still in my teeth, and nodded. I decided to chalk my absent taste buds as some sort of sinus issue. It was September, after all, and I would often have similar allergy symptoms to those I dealt with in the spring that time of the year. My less rational section of brain was insisting I reconsider my stance on this. First, he rubbed your head and your hair fell out. Could you be the victim of a ravenous nasal boop now? The little voice in my head questioned. I would not allow myself to entertain any such ideas at this time. I chose to silence the nagging in the back of my head and simply enjoy the company of my loving parents for a time. As I predicted, my folks couldn't shed any light on potentially traumatic events from my youth, but I was pretty certain of the fact before heading out there that day. They did mention that I had an almost unhealthy obsession with my little stuffed frog, Bernie. Apparently, I built this toy up in my immature mind as an imaginary friend. We didn't live around many other families at the time, so I would dive into a fantastical world of my own with Bernie at my side. We fought pirates and evil knights with sinister agendas and even traveled the stars in a cardboard spaceship from time to time. That was until we had an apparent falling out. My mother threw open the door to my room while I was in the middle of pitching a legendary fit while tearing my beloved stuffed frog to shreds. I claimed that he turned bad and wanted to steal my life away from me while my mom grappled to hold me still. Somehow, in my rage, I'd managed to carve several small gashes into my face and forearms, presumably from my fingernails. She wrapped her arms around me in an attempt to prevent me from causing myself more harm. I had no memory of the small plush animal that she showed me in our family photo albums, nor the shredding of it. I recognized my bedroom and my other toys that the pictures reflected, but I had no recollection of Bernie and his big, bulging eyes. As the hour grew late, I bid my folks good night and began my journey home. I promised them I would not wait so long before coming out to see them again, and I meant every word. The day's revelations had unsettled me, but I truly did enjoy sharing my parents' company again. On my ride home, with little to occupy my mind outside the radio, I found my thoughts wandering away from the road ahead. It wasn't until I heard the blazing horn from headlights that were speeding toward me that I snapped out of my pensive daze. I jerked the steering wheel to the right in an effort to get back into the lane I was meant to be in. I heard the other car screaming from beside me as my overcorrection left me careening toward the trees that paralleled the road. I pulled the wheel in the opposite direction but still slammed sideways into a thick and hefty tree. The violent collision caused my head to smash into my side window, cracking the glass and rendering me unconscious. Owie! The high-pitched voice said, awakening me from my unconscious state. 
That looks like it hurts bad, he continued, as he reached his soft mitt across the compacted passenger seat. He used a padded thumb to wipe blood from my left eye. I had no idea the extent of my injuries, but I could feel the dried blood crack when I made a wincing expression due to the pounding of my head. I adjusted my posture back to an upright position and turned to face the six-foot puppet who currently rode shotgun in my steaming car. Since most of the damage was on the passenger side, it appeared that I only suffered wounds inflicted by the impact itself, though my left foot had somehow jammed under the brake pedal. I tugged at it with my hands, wrapped around my upper thigh, but I couldn't get it free until... I'll help you, old buddy, old pal! came from the felt-faced man who sat next to me, before he contorted his soft body sideways to grip my leg with his felt-lined fingers. He made exaggerated grunting sounds while he wiggled my foot back and forth, ultimately freeing it from beneath the pedal. I found myself a little surprised and somewhat intimidated by the strength those cushioned, plushed hands showed. Thank you, I replied, still in degree of shock, but sincerely grateful to the strange man in the frog onesie. Thank you. My jaw fell agape when his squeaky voice morphed into mine. It wasn't until that moment that I noticed the new addition to his face. A fleshy human nose now took the place of a small nub with the hollow nostrils that had previously sat just below his beady eye holes. See you later, buddy. He spoke through my own words before my eyes closed again. When I awoke on a hospital bed, I felt confused and lost for a moment. Over the hours that followed, the doctor informed me of my injuries, which included a deep gash across my eyebrow, a slight contusion, and an unexplainable series of bruising on my left leg. I investigated my shin to see darkened flesh in the pattern of a four-fingered hand. I stayed overnight at the doctor's recommendation and would find more troubling revelations the following day. After the bandages were removed, I still could not see anything out of my left eye. On top of that, I found myself unable to move my left leg from the knee down. They ran several tests to check for nerve damage and the like, but could come to no positive conclusion as to why my limb hung limp and lifeless. As the day progressed, my voice grew scratchy and I would find myself coughing whenever I attempted to speak. Again, no answers can be found to account for this ailment either. I could no longer ignore the reality of what was happening to me, though I could not convince anyone to believe my story. Over the weeks that followed, I started seeing a psychiatrist and endured a number of pointless sleep studies. The shrink prescribed me a variety of medications, and he seemed convinced my issues were psychosomatic. As weeks led to months, I still hadn't regained my sense of smell or the sight in my left eye. I continued to walk with the limp with the aid of a cane, which was another recommendation from my doctor. I can still speak, but only for so long at a time before I start coughing as my throat goes more scratchy with every word uttered. It would be close to a year before I had another meeting with the felt-faced puppet man. It's been a while, huh? My voice uttered from beside my bed, causing the night's sleep to come to an end. I turned to face him before adjusting myself into a sitting position in my bed. He still had his unnatural glow, but he now had human lips to go with the nose he had stolen before. I noticed the left leg of his onesie was now cut short below his knee to reveal a fleshy shin and foot. His hair was longer now, almost hanging to his shoulder, and his left eye hole had been replaced by a light blue, human-like eye. It didn't surprise me to see these new aspects to his appearance, as I had no misconceptions about what had truly caused the ailments I still suffered from. What do you want now, Bernie? I asked with a heavy sigh. Just one last thing, he said with a wide smile spreading across his fleshy mouth. He even had a row of sparkling white teeth behind them. At least he wouldn't have to steal mine. 
Go on, then, I replied, growing impatient at the knowledge I was about to become even more disabled than I was before I'd laid down that night. He clumsily walked toward the bed and reached a hand out to my right ear. He rubbed his felt hand across it before whipping a tarnished silver coin from behind it. He held it out in front of me before dropping it onto the bed. For all the trouble, he said as I felt the hearing fade from where he had brushed. A comically loud popping sound erupted from the side of his head as a fleshy ear appeared in place of the previous half-circle of felt. I picked up the coin he'd bounced onto my bed. I looked at it to see that it didn't look like any currency I was familiar with. I turned my gaze back to the strange mix of puppetry and human parts before me with my head tilted. I figure it's the least I can do, after all you've done for me, he replied with a chuckle that sounded like a bizarre combination of his previously high-pitched laugh and my own. So, is this the last time? I asked, dreading the answer. He placed the stuffed forefinger to his mouth and turned his stolen eye up at the ceiling. Might just be, he replied, still glaring upward. He turned his head back to me and held his left arm straight out in front of him with his fingers outstretched. Let's shake on it, he said, smiling even wider than before. You said one last thing. You already took my fucking ear. I exclaimed, both frustrated and angry. He didn't say a word. He just stood there, frozen in place with that creepy grin. Fuck it, I said with a heavy sigh. At least I'm a righty. I concluded, grasping his soft hand in mind, fully expecting this to be the last time I'd be able to use those fingers. With another comically loud pop, he disappeared right before my eyes. I'd never actually seen him leave before, so maybe this was actually the last time. It's been two years since that night, and I still have the use of both my hands. Sure, the left one has a tendency to lock up at times, and it grows steadily more painful the more I use it, but I can't complain. I still only have one good eye, one good ear, no sense of smell, but... Things could be worse. The gift my fleshed and felted visitor left me with turned out to be a flowing hair, silver, copper dollar that I sold at auction for around seven and a half million, after taxes, of course. This allowed me to enjoy ample comfort to distract me from my disabilities, so I can't say it was a complete waste. I even had my useless leg removed and replaced with a prosthetic that is far more easy to work with than a limp chunk of flesh and bone that just dangled there before. I never got answers to who that puppet man really was, or how he was able to steal from me what he did. Could he really be a product of my childhood mind who somehow found himself tangible and sentient? I highly doubt it. There's lots of crazy shit out there, as my granddad used to say. There's no telling if I'll ever see Bernie again, or if he'll feel the need to rob me of any more senses if he should. I still sleep with the light on, and I still battle with insomnia, but perhaps my nightmare has actually ended. I still awaken to the sound of high-pitched, eerie laughter from time to time, but that just may be my mind playing tricks. Just beware of the shadows that play across your walls in the wee hours of the morning. You never know if there's something real hiding amongst them. <laughs>